cafe. Hi, um, so I'm Henry. Um, I am the CEO of Social Impact Business Together All. Um, I've been with the business uh, coming up to three and a half years. Um, today I thought I would tell you a little bit, just a little bit about Together All for those who don't know it, but some of the student data we've got. But I'll also, I think, very relevant to what I've seen before, share um, some of the learnings that we, we took out of COVID. So we saw huge different change in activity, things happening on the platform, so some of the lessons that we learned that, that may be of interest um, to this group here. So, first of all, oh, I don't want to do that. Sorry, technical issue. We believe in the power of community. I think we believe in the ability for people to help people. Um, you know, the benefits of community uh, well documented, used in many different environments, medical settings, unfortunately if you have cancer, if you're suffering from grief, if you're trying to deal with alcoholism, the benefits of community are well known. That's the benefits of sharing, the opportunity to share your stories, the, opposite, the sense of supporting, huge amount of evidence about the power of helping someone else is very therapeutic to helping yourself. Um, normalization, understanding what you're experiencing, other people are experiencing. Um, lived experience, we've heard about that, people sharing ideas, how, what they've done to manage certain situations, and ultimately we just heard about it, creating a sense of belonging. Um, huge amount of clinical validation of the power of community, and one of the things I think that's really important for you guys to know is there is huge demand for it. And the worrying thing is, is when you look at social media, and I'm sure you're aware of it, how many individuals are going onto social media searching for mental health support? Um, I think one of the big questions you've got to ask is, is that the appropriate place? Are these the appropriate places to go to for mental health support? Because people are going there in millions. And if you look at some of the conversations they have, they are terrifying. And then you hear some of the well-documented stories of what happens. So the demand is there, the clinical benefit is there. So, what are we? And, and, and I'm hoping many of you may know who we are already, so, but I can obviously take questions and I'll be around at lunch after if uh, I don't want this to be an advert to Together All. So, but first of all, we are accessible. So we are a, an anonymous platform that is available 24-7. That is, everything that happens on the platform is clinically moderated to make sure it is a safe, positive environment. If individuals are identified with clinical risk, either to themselves or to someone else, we make sure they get to a safe place, whether that be student services, whether that be crisis teams for our veterans, whether that be emergency services, etc. We're probably doing about 
two to five of those a day at the moment. So this is something that's very real, where we have to step in and make sure people are getting to the right place. Um, over 20 million people have access to the platform. Uh, in 2020, we supported over 100,000. We have a commissioning model, which is basically we get commissioned by organizations such as here to provide access to students um, or to military or to NHS trusts. We're used by a number of NHS trusts, local authorities, et cetera. So that's us. Um, what I would point out, and I think some of the data that we have um, to sort of share is we have a lot of data. We have huge amounts of data. I think we've helped almost 400,000 people. So just, just to put it out there, for you, those who are in data, we have 400,000 people have used the platform. Uh, we can learn a lot of different things, but here's a couple of things. So first of all, do individuals find it helpful? And when people look at the platform, we have different things. We have the community. We have the mental health professionals that are called wall guides. And we get constant feedback from our members that they find these services helpful. Okay, it has made an impact for them. If we take a slightly more scientific approach, we, and, and I realize and I'm with academics, so I, I say that sort of lightly, but we, um, one of the things that we have, last year over 37,000 people did self-assessments on the platform. So one of the real values of the platform, people go onto the platform and say, I want to assess my mental health, it's an anonymous setting, no one knows about it, etc. So we have a load, a load of people doing GAD7, PHQ9, SWEMS web, sleep, sleep assessments, etc. That also means that we have a whole section of the population that have done repeat assessments. And when we analyze those repeat assessments, we see significant reductions in anxiety and depression. Okay? Caveat. 50% of together or use us in conjunction with other services. So I'm not saying it's just us, but part of that experience, we are seeing definite decreases, specifically from severe anxiety and severe depression, we're seeing populations shift over time. So there's real sort of nice evidence. And then the final thing is, you know, one of the things that we know a lot, and university students, universities, UK, we are in a market where unfortunately, demand is going to outstrip supply. We are not able to deliver to the mental health needs of the population. In the world today, there are 700 million people suffering from anxiety and depression. Okay? There is no way that we can provide one-to-one -one therapy or support for all of those individuals. So we're going to need to find other ways to do it. And we are seeing you know, significant wait lists from the NHS, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the things that we want to understand is how do we fit into the ecosystem, what do we do? So 76% of individuals who say that they have been using other mental health services find together a very supportful tool post-discharge. So when you suddenly say the sessions are over, where do I go? Here's a place to go. It's what we call wraparound care. 73% found together or hopeful when they're waiting on a wait list. What do I do when I'm told that I can't go and see someone for three months? And actually, two-thirds found it helpful compared with other services that they use. So there, there is some sort of, sort of compelling evidence for what it does. But today, I'm going to talk about particularly about what, what we saw in COVID. But first of all, just to give you a view. So I looked at data from the last couple of years. I pulled this off our platform uh, yesterday, actually, just to give me a flavor. And, and one of the things, when people come onto the platform, we ask them two questions. What are you experiencing at the moment? And what have you experienced in the last six months? And the thing, you know, we have some, you know, huge numbers of anxiety, depression, stress at work, home, relationship problems. Probably nothing particularly surprising there in the profile of the students. We then say, in the last six months, have you experienced? And the bit that stands out, I put in red, is 60% of this population who's visiting us have in the last six months thought about harming themselves or harming or ending their own life. Okay? So, you know, from our point of view, this is a population with serious need. Okay? This isn't, this isn't and our data shows, typically across our whole database, about 20% have suicidal thoughts. So, this is actually significantly higher in the student population than the general population. 
is having those having suicidal thoughts. So there is a huge need out there for what you guys are talking about, supporting and trying to address, and, and, and it's a challenge. So what did we see when COVID hit? I mean, it was, for any of you, it was a very interesting moment in our life because we had spent two years rebuilding our technology platform to make sure it was robust and strong and secure. Um, the platform had been a long time. We completely rebuilt it. In March, we launched a new platform, and then COVID hit two weeks later. And I, it's one of the most grateful things because I think what happened next was stunning. We saw a doubling in the use of Together All overnight, so sudden access, and that's in the number of unique members. We saw the amount of logins that they did go up by three times. So twice as many members using us three times as much. And we saw significant increases in risk. You know, so we saw a lot more individuals being identified as clinical risk, et cetera. Interestingly, not so much from the student population. Actually, where we saw the biggest risk jump is the employee population. And when you think about furlough and financial insecurity and stuff like that, I think you understand, you know, that was well. They actually became more risky than our um, military personnel. So we saw this amazing shift happen in the platform. Talking about age, we saw a three-time shift in over 65s using the platform. And then when we started to look what was happening in the platform, we, at that stage, we couldn't report on the themes that we have, but we really looked into what the themes were. And the themes, and we talked about it before, the themes that we saw were around issues like isolation, so feeling isolated. There was huge health anxiety, but interestingly, the health anxiety, the biggest health anxiety we saw was not people catching COVID, it was giving it to others. So people were very worried about giving it to relatives and worried. Um, we saw a lot of issues about people living in close proximity with people they don't know, uh, um, in families that they haven't been in contact. We actually saw more and more issues around problematic behavior, which we had to escalate at home, so bullying and stuff like that. So it was interesting. We saw people were suddenly pushed together and made to live together that hadn't, hadn't, hadn't done that. So we saw this sort of, this, this real change in the platform that obviously became very related to uh, the experience there. And, and what is interesting, all the things that I've heard you talk about this morning, we saw in our platform, okay? We absolutely saw those behaviors. And this is across hundreds of, you know, this is, I think in, in the last year, we did something like 50,000 students. So this is, I think, statistically quite significant when you start to look at the data and the, the, the values of what we're talking about. So what did we learn? And I think I've given four, key takeaways, which I think actually, I think you, you might have thought I'd seen the presentations before, but I haven't. So I'm going to give you my, my four lessons before. So the first one was, we absolutely understand that we are living in a world now where, not just in the student area, where demand is outstripping supply. Okay. And particularly in the student area, you have student services resources, medical resources that are hugely stretched and hugely struggling to keep up with the need. And just adding more people is probably not going to be the answer. We also understand that there is very much a different level of support that individuals need. Okay, so some may just want a community, some need therapy, some need drugs, some need you know, all different levels of performance. So we very much believe that population health care needs to come to the fore in the student area. How can we provide resources that are genuinely accessible to all? Okay, now, you know, we obviously see our role in that as peer to peer in a clinically safe environment. But I think universities and education and everywhere actually needs to be thinking about how do we provide something to everyone in a safe that does have clinical benefit, does address issues like belonging and isolation, which may be you know, harder to prove the value, but providing those access to those tools to everyone is really important. Otherwise, student services teams 
are going to be, you know, it's, it's going to become an impossible situation to keep up. Okay? So I think that is coming. And we are seeing more and more focus around this term population health care. Okay? Where, whether it's in the NHS, whether it's Alberta Health Services, etc. How do we use technology potentially, but how do we create population health care? It doesn't have to be technology driven, and I'll talk about that. But how do we get support out there. And, and interesting, I've, I've just come back from the States, and I'll talk about it now. There is a huge, huge gathering of momentum in the, the U.S. Even the president, the, the president of the state of the Union, is the value of peer-to-peer, -peer because it is something that can be much more population rolled out and the value it can be provided. So it's a really interesting time thinking about how do we, how do we meet all the different levels of need and how do we make sure the resources are appropriate at that lead, but ultimately enables us to reach the whole population. Okay? I think that, that, so that to me is one of the key lessons that is growing and needed and, and I think what COVID did is put the system under so much stress that it realized the system needs to look at ways, different ways of doing things. Okay? Because it just isn't going to keep up. And I think the other thing, just, just, you know, we hear about, so we hear a lot, and they use a phrase in Canada called the echo pandemic, which is how they talk about the mental health issue that is going to be caused by COVID. So it's the long tail. And, and um, so there's some really interesting data about what happened after the global financial crisis, the mental health, and how many years it fled through the system. You know, the impact of this, I think we're going to see something very similar with COVID, where we're going to see this tail of impact last for a number of number of years and we're not going to suddenly go oh, we're out of it we're going to see the impact of this going on for a long time um the lesson i think was the most heartening and i think we probably all saw it is that we learned from covid and we rely on in our community because of sharing and supporting is people want to help you know, people want to, the, the, the world, the average community wants to stand up and help others. Okay? It is an amazing resource if you think about that. There are people who are out there who are willing to help and engage on a purpose that means something for a good purpose for the benefits of others. Think very carefully about that because that is a resource that we should be all tapping into. It isn't always easy, and, and we're, you know, we have seen it, particularly in U.S. universities where peer programs really have grown, where it causes real challenge because they're not med medically monitored and they cause bad results and stuff like that. And we've actually, in the U.S., been planning this initiative called Train Peers. We had four universities, and they had volunteers within the universities who wanted to support people with mental health, and we put them through some training, and then we put them on the platform for eight weeks, and then we monitor them and give them training on how to be a good listener, how to give good advice, etc. And at the end of the eight weeks, they go, you've done your certain hours, you're certified. It's a safe, great environment to drive help and support. And out of it, hopefully, comes this army of people who can help other people. And I think it's really important. And I think this is one of the biggest lessons on COVID for everyone. And if I was in government, which unfortunately, well, fortunately, I'm not, but if I was in government or anything, I would be thinking, how do we tap into this resource? Because we know resources are scarce, and this is a resource we can tap into. So how do we do that? And I think that's really, really important. The other issue, when we heard about this this morning, is we need to provide access to all students. So most mental health services are used. The biggest population by far is white women. Okay? And there are other populations who are not accessing mental health services, either because of their race, because of stigma, because they're blokes who don't want to talk about it. You know, all of those different, different issues. And I think, and this is what I was saying, so I, exactly what, what was said earlier, is we have to work really hard to address that issue. Okay? And, you know, we believe we're good at that because, you know, if you talk about the reasons why people join, guess what? It's available 24-7, so sort of like two-thirds of our users comes us out of ours. 
I don't tend to have my anxiety attacks at two in the afternoon. I tend to have them at two in the morning. I don't know about you. That's when I wake up and go, oh my God, my life's a mess. And it goes completely out of scale. And then I'm trying to grapple it and being able to talk to someone. Two in the afternoon, I might be presenting somewhere like here. I'm not thinking about it. I'm thinking about something else. Okay? So I think that's really important. Anonymity. This idea of stigma and safe place. 50% of our users come to us because they feel safe. And, and 41% because it's immediate access. So we go into the waiting list. How do I get to people really quickly? How do I, how do I, I need this help now. I don't need it in three months' time. I want to talk to someone now. I want to deal with my panic attack, uh, whatever it is. So those are really important. And I think when you start to think about that, so 38% of our university population identifies non-white. Okay? So that we are make, getting out there, 5% gender non-confirming, 32% are over 25 years old. So we're also, it's not just that goes to the point of, it's not just the young and the, the navigates, so you can reach all. What is really nice is 39% of those who came on had never shared their problem anywhere else. Okay? They hadn't told anyone about it. And we all know, that, and, and how the clip showed you at the beginning, and I think that's what it really talks to, is that place where you can start talking about mental health. You can start opening up. You can start realizing, I'm not the only one with this problem. There are other people, and what, what do they do? And one of the best stories I ever heard was our chair was um, having a, a meeting with a lady uh, who lived in Wandsworth, where, where we cover. And she, said, and she said, well, first of all, before we meet, I want to thank you. And, so, and, and he's like, why? And he said, well, you know, you're, you're part of Together All, and I want to tell you a story. So she, she basically said, my daughter, unbeknownst to me, was having serious mental health issues. And she went on to Together All and started talking about it and sharing. And once she realized she wasn't the only one. But actually, the best thing was the community came back to them her, and said, have you talked to your mum? And she went, no. And the community went around and said, really think you should. Why didn't you try your mum? I'm sure she understands. And said, and thanks to Together All, my daughter is now talking to her about my mental health issues that I didn't even know she was having. Okay, and that's the sort of conversation I think is really powerful. Opening up, talking, etc. 35% um, say they have no other form of support. Probably not true, but it's an awareness issue, etc. especially in the universities. As I talked about before, you know, huge numbers. These are, this is actually quite a serious community. This isn't a community without issues. A third of them are severe to moderate when we look at anxiety and depression. 31% have had suicidal thoughts in the last six months. Okay, so this is, this is a serious community that's engaging. Okay? It is only part of it. And then the final lesson, and I think this is the hardest one okay, for us, is driving awareness is key and not easy. And this goes to all of your mental health services. I saw it put up there. We did some qualitative age of research with a few of our university clients, and we found typical awareness of Together All was at 20% of the population. Okay? Some of our universities, we get a 5% adoption rate. But if, if awareness is only at 20%, that's huge. And that is the real challenge. The, the real challenge, though, and I've been thinking a lot about this, is not about you or whatever. The, the real challenge is the problem with mental health in creating awareness is it is not linear. I am not in a stable, you know, constant stable state. The one moment I'm fine, I'm presenting here. Next moment I'm having a bit of a wobble at two in the morning. You know, it's that sort of thing, different areas. And actually... Most of the time, if, I, you know, if I'm listening and someone goes, these resources are here, these resources are here, I'm going to go, oh, well, I'll get to them if I ever need them. The problem is, when I need them, my mind's addled, it's the middle of the night, I don't know where I'm going, and I go, I don't know where to go. And that is a really, really big challenge of how do you... So, service like Together, we talk about this point of need. Most people who come to us are starting to feel a bit anxious, worried, has an issue they want to address, they want to reach out to people. It's not, you know, I want to build mental health resilience, which I think is a really good idea. It is, I have a need and I want to reach out, and that's why I reach out at two in the morning, that's why I reach out and have this conversation. 
the challenges. And that's great. We're there when they need it. The problem is most people don't know we're there when they need it. And doing that, and I don't think there is any easy fix. And, you know, we're talking about integrating maybe with Moodle, you know, so all the different ways that we can get in front of people. But it's hard. We have had organizations buy us, <coughs> not even put it on their website, and then come to us and say, well, no one's using you. You know, like, wow. So it's a real, real challenge, this. And this is not just for us. I think one of the biggest challenges that you have is how do you make people aware of what is there and how do they use it? Because people won't pay attention until they need it. And yet you're not going to be in front of them when they need it. So it's, it's, it's a real challenge for the, the thing. And I think, you know, when, you're, when you think about that, you know, the organizations within the universities who are doing it have very stretched and limited capacity. So they don't have the time to go and think about that. Probably have, most of them have not been recruited because they are good at driving B2C awareness campaigns. You know, that's not why they've joined student services, but actually it's really, really important. Um, often they've got multiple services to promote. So how do you get mind share, et cetera? And then we come to the other point where we saw a lot of communities are very hard to reach. Okay. You know, um, one, of the, one of our biggest customers is the military. And we learned from the military that one of the worst ways to get soldiers to engage is have one of the leaders stand up and say, here's a place for mental health. All the soldiers go, no thanks, not going to touch you. I don't know what the politics are in the universities and stuff like that, but you've got to have a really good hard look at where are students going to get their information. Not where do you want them to go, but where are they going? And where do they go to get their advice? And where do they go? Because trying to change that behavior is really hard. Trying to tap into it is really easy. And I think, you know, we all face this challenge of if we really want to make a difference, we've got to get them aware of what's there. Because I think there are some great things out there that are just not being used and utilized the way they should be, and they would have a much bigger difference. So that's my sort of four lessons. So I think whatever you're doing, you do need solutions that work for total populations. Okay, you need to think about how you cover ground as well as you know, re really dig in. I think there is this amazing untapped resource of students, people, public wanting to help others. And I think if we can mobilize that army, there's a real opportunity to change things. Some populations are harder to engage, but they need support and often not. We recently created a strategic partnership with Movember. Because guess what? People like me don't typically reach out for mental health services. Um, they don't want to talk about it. They have stigma, but we have very high, high, some of the highest suicide rates. So we created a partnership with Movember, and we just had a webinar last week, I think, really addressing is how do you get men to engage in mental health services? We find it challenging. You know, we absolutely find it challenging. The reason we signed a strategic partnership with member of Movember is that's what they specialize in so they can help that. And we're really open to having conversations with all different special groups, identities, whatever, but how do we tap into those people? Because it's a challenge. Um, it is a challenge we've got to do that. But they need support. And it's really, really important. And, and I think it's on us. And then finally is driving awareness is fundamental and a challenge. And I'm not sure I have... I'd love to have some advice and answers for it. I think we're trying to work it through as well. But it is, it's, it's, this, is a t this is a mutual team issue that we need to address. So that's it. Thank you very much for letting me present. <laughs> Any questions? Oh, excellent. A few. This one. You may not be able to answer it. I'll do my best. Uh, thank you for that. That was really interesting. Um, I was wondering about um, what you were saying about awareness. My mind goes to we're going into Freshers' Week quite soon in the fall. Um, are there, and you, you might already make these available and I'm just not aware, but are there sort of materials and things that universities could go and download to give out during Freshers' Week, fairs, that kind of thing? I don't think there are. Yes, there are. <laughs> Great, thank you. 
Um, my question was just, I've not used your platform. Um, but I think what it sounds like is basically a moderated forum. So the support on the website is from other users providing support. So you're kind of tapping into that fear thing, but you've managed to monetize it. Yeah, so we, so individuals from platforms, mm -hmm. some go there to get help, some go there to get benefits for giving help, normally they're mutual good, mm -hmm. so people will share their support, support and stuff like that. So yeah, we are actually doing that. And what we have though is everything on the platform is clinically moderated and managed using technology, people buy clinically. So we are putting a whole clinical wrap around that as well. So it's not just saying we're just going to create a capsule for people talking to people. It's actually, I think, the clever bit of what we really do is how we keep it moderated to clinically safe for the good environment. And that, and that requires hiring clinical staff as well. I wonder if there's um, a piece of you actually training the people that are already in their class WhatsApp groups or that kind of thing. Um, because we're already offering that peer to peer support, but there is no moderator, there's no clinical supervisors in those group chats or whatever. And maybe that's a way of, of going forward um, for universities to do is put in people who are already in those groups, those classrooms and stuff, using that same kind of model with that, that peer support training that you were talking about before. Yeah, I think that's, so I think the peer support training we were talking about before is making sure we've got peer support. But, mm -hmm. but if you think about the structure here, so we have a community that helps its community. Then we have mental health professionals, maybe mental health nurses, counsellors, etc. And then we have a layer of clinical team above that. Yeah. Okay? And typically, and with it, and every 1,000 people that come from the platform, we probably need to escalate nine to take a period of clinical work. So mm -hmm. what you have is the peers don't do that. Right. Okay, so someone is like, the counsellors don't do that. They will look at someone and engage in a conversation, they'll moderate. Anyone who's at risk is moderated 24 hours a day, okay. everything they do on the platform. So about 20% of the pop, someone says I've got suicidal ideation, that would be flagged on the platform. And everything they do on the platform would be watched using technology and monitoring in case they're at risk. Okay? Mm -hmm. So I don't think you can get a peer to do that. So they are monitored from a clinical point of view. If that individual then thinks that there is clinical risk, they will bring in one of our clinicians which is available 24 hours a day to look at that and make a clinical decision of is that person a suicide risk or not. We keep our mental health professionals away from that because that's a very stressful thing. So the last thing I want is a peer individual having to deal with someone who's talking about drinking a bottle of bleach, real case sorry, or someone who's talking about the fact that their mental health state they can't look after their children or that they're being abused by their father. You know, all of, I don't, you don't want peers doing that. You want peers doing the active listening and the support, and then you want to be able to step it up to the clinical risk. Because otherwise, you're, one, you're putting an immense of unfair pressure on those peers, which is, and as I say, it's not even our mental, when it gets clinical risk, we move it to a clinician, not to a mental health nursing professional. Because that is a very, very stressful space to be in. And, as, and so I don't, yeah, so I think it's, Great to use, but if you're putting in peer support into a WhatsApp group, mm -hmm. what happens when someone says, I'm going to kill myself? Yeah. Where do they go? And who do they do that? Yeah. And, 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 but are they the ones to judge? Mm -hmm. Because also, because of anonymity, we break the bar when we have a clinical judgment of someone. It's not a, when a clinician says, This is a break the bar situation, I think that's enough evidence that they're at risk for themselves or someone else. We are going to break the bar and try to de anonymize that individual and make sure that we can get them if necessary. We can turn up the police and say, You need to get here and break this up as well. So it's, it's, yeah, peer support is very important, but it's the rapid that goes around it that I think is really tough. Mm -hmm. Two quick questions over here before we go to lunch. Before I'll, I'll, I'll stay around right for lunch. Thank you. Uh -huh. Do you want to talk to me? Hello. Um, two questions. Um, if the university was going to, my university, for example, was going to invest in embedding together on the virtual learning platform, um, are the students part of a closed network of the university or in a They're closed in a network community. of students? In a global so community. Everyone is. It's one global community. It's all 
as a community, you know, I give you a really nice example that our, our CRO was going on to a chat room with students talking about bullying. And they were talking about bullying, and then into the community uh, individual, you know, the lady came in and said, you know, actually, I'm not a student, I'm a mother, and I have two children. Said, but I was bullied at university. She said, the one thing I want you all to know is that they're safe. That is the power of community. You've got someone going in and saying, this is my lived experience. And so our community has you know, all different groups, people set up chats around different things, but it is one global community, whether it's a veteran, whether it's an employee, whether it's a member of uh, Newcastle and Gateshead Public and the Health Service, or whether it's a university student. Okay, and do you, are you able to share data from users with back to the university? So we can share aggregated data. Of the... We won't share the individual data. Not so the individuals, but of their student population. Yeah, so they can access, the same university can access their own data through a portal. Perfect. So they can analyse themes and stuff like that. Thanks. Um, you're framing this as, as safe in some ways, because ultimately at the top of the year, yeah. the triangle, you've got people who can break the glass. But when they break the glass, where is it going? So I, I, as well as being an academic, I'm a, a psychologist. Yeah. I broke the glass so at the end of last week for a survey, there is no service. So yeah. I guess that's pretty much a reality that is out there. So my, my worry We always is do a warm handover. Okay. okay. So we never do a phone someone up, look after that. So we have, with each university, with each commissioning org, we work out with our expected population. Sometimes it's straight to emergency services. So we will phone up emergency services and say, you know, and we have had Soldiers being met at the cliffs of Dover. Someone said, I'm on a train, I'm going to throw myself off. We can't get hold of them. The train was free, so we haven't identified those. So we do a warm handover, and one of the things that, you know, and then, you know, we will have different partners. So in the States, there's a partner that specifically does this. So, so but, but every, what's the agreement form we do with every single commission? RMA. So with every organization commission, we talk about a risk management agreement about how we're going to manage their state risk. Some organizations go, we want you to go straight to emergency services. We don't have the capacity to deal with it. Some of us will go, if it's within the daytime, come to us first. If it's the nighttime, go. So it, it depends. But, but our, we, you know, and sometimes it's hours and hours and hours. Don't, don't get it wrong. You know, some, when, and one of the reasons we, we give it to clinicians is because it's not people managing the community. Some of those conversations might be over a couple of days. Still communicating, or they can't. And they're working with the police, or they're working with the chase, the general practitioner, and they're working with the crisis team. So those those often can take a long time. 